Yo, yo, yo. <clears throat> Welcome, one and all. Somebody's got their uh, microphone on. I can hear some crunching in the background. And I've got mesophobia, so it makes me feel like light sounds. That's even worse. There's kids in the background. Was it television? So if you can all make sure you mute your mics, please, guys. There'll be an opportunity at the end to answer questions. So you can post those questions in your uh, in the comments box, and I can scroll back through those and answer those. So if there's anything that comes up in the course of the discussion, then feel free to ask away, and I'll scroll back through those to the end. So it's five past two. I'm going to get I'm going to crack on and get started. I'm still admitting people into the uh, into the meeting. So for those of you who don't know me, my name's Aaron. I'm one half of MoFo Body Mechanic. Um, I'm a sports osteopath. I also do senior lecturer. Uh, so yeah, been there, seen it, done all that usual stuff. Um, and we're going to talk today a little bit about uh, muscle injuries and how you diagnose and treat them. The audience out there is PTs, hi Phoebe, therapists, right, so I'm going to get started, so muscle injuries, now these are a common problem, I think these probably from my perspective, as I work in, a, in the industry of bodybuilders and powerlifters, and strong men and strong women. These tend to be probably the second most common thing that you're gonna encounter. Uh, that's behind tendon injuries. So if you missed out on our tendinopathy webinar that we did uh, a few weeks ago, you can check that out on YouTube. So muscle injuries, so 55% of all injuries sustained in a, an active population are gonna be coming from muscle strains. And it's a strain, not a sprain. Sprains are what happen to ligaments. Um, now, in terms of the diagnosis of these things, so I'm going to put a classification system on. This isn't so you can classify your, your injury. This is more so you can start to work out what injury you've got. Now, a grade one muscle strain is where you've torn a few fibres, there's minimal swelling, and there's minimal loss of function. Now, these tend to be really you tend to find that uh, grade ones, as opposed to grade threes, where you've got a complete rupture, they're actually more painful because you're getting a lot of nerve irritation. With a grade three, because the nerve has been, along with the tendon, the nerve and the muscle have been severed, and as a result, it's less painful. So you tend to find grade ones, there's minimal damage, minimal swelling, and minimal loss of function. So that tends to be how you, how you classify those. Grade two, You've got moderate fiber damage. There's a notable loss of function. In this case, it'd be strength. So if we're talking about muscle strains, the notable loss of function would be a loss of strength, and there's some visible swelling. Now, those of you who've had hamstring strains, pec strains, the faster that bleeding occurs, the faster that bruise develops, you tend to find the more likelihood you've got a grade two or above type injury. Uh, and that's certainly what I see from a, a clinical perspective with the guys I work with. You know, people walk into the treatment room and the back of the leg's black, calf's black, or the whole chest area is black, or their biceps is black because of the amount of bruising and bleeding that's taking place within the muscle. So that's a really good indication in terms of the severity of the injury if there's a loss of strength and you've got some noticeable, noticeable bleeding or bruising taking place. Now, grade three, this is where you've got a significant amount of fiber damage, and there'll be significant swelling and bleeding. Um, and there'll probably be almost a complete loss of function. So if we're talking about the hamstrings, the three hamstring muscles, the one that's most commonly injured is biceps femoris, which is on the outside. And you tend to find they wouldn't be able to do any external rotation of their tibia 
whilst they're in a flexed knee position. So that's where the muscle is most active. So classification is more from a diagnostic perspective. That's useful because it's going to give you an indication of how severe uh, the injury is presenting. Now, how do these things occur? So you tend to find most muscle injuries occur as we transition from a concentric contraction, that's where the muscle is shortening under load, to an eccentric contraction, that's where it's lengthening under load. So thinking about it from a like bodybuilding, gym perspective, the most common places these things occur, bottom of the bench press, as you're transitioning from out of the hole, you've taken the bar down onto your chest, and you're gonna reverse that movement back up, that's typically where the pec tendon occurs, or pec, sorry, the, the muscle strain occurs in the pecs. Um, you tend to find in the hamstrings, it's as we are running. So as you're trying to decelerate the tibia, you tend to find that's the point as we transition from that concentric movement into the eccentric movement, again, where those things tend to occur. So high eccentric load is what tends to cause these injuries. And this is a stress strain curve, and I thought this was a useful thing to put up because it gives you some insight into the, the mechanical properties of a muscle. So the toe region, if you look to the left-hand side of your screen, this is where your muscle is crimped. So basically the muscle isn't elongated. There's a certain amount of give in all muscles. There's like a, bit of a, a, a yield point, which when you start to initiate muscle contraction, first thing that happens is that crimping that you can see at the top of the screen, it straightens out. So it then takes up the slack. We then move into the elastic region. And this is obviously where the muscle starts to stretch as it's being worked. Now, if you exceed the elastic region, you move into what they call the plastic region. Now, very much like a, a plastic ruler, keep bending it forwards and backwards, eventually it's to form and eventually it snaps. And that's essentially what happens in the plastic region. So you start to get deformation of the muscle fibers, you carry on loading past that point, you then move into the failure region or the failure point, and that's where the muscle actually tears. Now the interesting thing is, I think from a training perspective, DOMS, so the delayed onset muscle soreness, the soreness you feel post-training is actually a large scale grade one muscle, um, muscle strain. So essentially when you're training, what you're doing is inducing a grade one muscle injury. And the reason we're doing that is because after we've created that grade one muscle injury, through the process of protein synthesis um, and cell signaling, that muscle injury starts to heal, the muscle gets bigger, and therefore we start to get the hypertrophy of the muscles. So this is one of the reasons why you, when you're talking to your clients, Training on a sore muscle, because essentially you've damaged that muscle, it's a grade one muscle strain, that's one of the things that you want to avoid, because essentially you're just adding insult to injury. Now, what are the risk factors? So, as you'd imagine, if we look back at that stress strain curve, if we have tight muscles, tight muscles tend to have no toe region, so the bit where it's crimped, so they're almost into the elastic region straight away, you've lost the crimping effect which means once you start to load those muscles, you then find that they reach the plastic zone much quicker. So flexibility, muscle length, is one of the biggest risk factors in terms of muscle injury. And certainly with the population group that I work with, you know, it's not just the tightness of the muscles, it's the size of the muscles that also contributes to that. Strength imbalances. So when we talk about the balance between the front of the body and the back of the body, there's various equations that we use, ratios that we use to work out how much strength the front should have in comparison to the back. So if we're talking about the hamstrings and the quads or the HQ ratio, it should be a two to one ratio there. And particularly in um, females, we tend to find that females are quad dominant. So for those females out there struggling to bring up their hamstrings and glutes, that isn't a genetic problem. That's a gender issue because you're quad dominant. And this is one of the reasons why females tend to have more, um, more ligament injuries, because it's certainly in the knees, like things like the ACL, because you tend to find a woman when she jumps and lands, tends to land with a straighter leg because she's more quad dominant. Whereas a guy will bend his knees more because he tends to be more hamstring and glute focused. 
So it's not a genetic problem, girls, if you can't build your hammies and your glutes up, it's a gender issue. Um, insufficient warm-up. So obviously we know all about the, the merits of warming up and increasing the extensibility of the tissues. So if you're not warming up proper, properly, you're not getting into your elastic region. And as a result, you're reaching the plastic region or the plastic zone much quicker. And then this concept of fatigue. Now fatigue is a really it's a complex subject area. There's two types of, of fatigue. You've got peripheral fatigue, which is what essentially stops you from training. So the burning sensation in your muscles. And then we've got something called central fatigue. Now central fatigue is your nervous system gets tired sending the signals to the muscles. So if you've done a heavy set of legs or a heavy session on legs, the day after, that feeling like you've got flu, that deep seated fatigue, just feeling a bit out of sorts, that's what central fatigue feels like. Now, if you were then to go and train in that state, things like coordination, proprioception, which is body, body's awareness of itself, all those things are affected, and that increases your risk of injury, certainly from a muscle injury perspective. So fatigue is a really important concept. And I think of all those risk factors, fatigue is one of the things that if you look at the injury risks and the injury rates in sports, fatigue is the common denominator. So looking at football, end of the first half, end of the second half, end of the season, those are the times where injuries tend to occur. Same in lots of other sports. So fatigue is one of those modifiable risk factors that seems to play a, uh, a bigger role in terms of muscle injury due to the effects on coordination and proprioception and muscle activation. Now, non-modifiable, so these are the things that we can't necessarily change. So you've got things like muscle composition. So all muscles are a combination of type one or type two fibers. And you'll find that certain muscles around your body have got a higher ponderance of type two fibers, other muscles have a higher ponderance of type one muscle fibers. And as a result, the ones with a higher proportion of type two have a higher risk of injury because they're able to produce more force. So things like your biceps muscle, your pec major muscle, the um, lateral part of your hamstrings, the biceps femoris portion, these have a higher predisposition or higher preponderance of type two muscle fibers. So capable of producing more force and therefore because of that force, they're obviously uh, more likely to get become injured. Age, so as you age, you're, it's a complex process, but hormone levels drop down. You start to find that because of those declining levels of hormones, you develop this thing called sarcopenia. And sarcopenia is age-related muscle loss. Now, along with that muscle loss, your muscle fibers actually become less elastic. So you tend to find as you age, certainly when you're getting into the sort of, this is going to frighten a lot of people, 35 onwards, sarcopenia starts to take place. So if you're over 35, you're in the, the, the death zone, if you like. Um, that's me, knackered. Um, but essentially, every year after 35, they reckon you lose about 1% of your total muscle mass due to this age-related muscle loss, this sarcopenic change. And alongside that, the muscle loss becomes less elastic. The less elastic muscle reaches the plastic zone quicker, and that then leads to failure much quicker. Previous injury, so this is one for your, you know, your, the, the dealing with your, your clients and their adherence to exercise and to their rehabilitation. So if you've had a previous injury, and the majority of people have had muscle injuries in the past, and you haven't rehabilitated that injury back up, you're more likely to get another injury in the same region because the tissues, as we're going to talk about in the next few slides, tissues haven't yet regained their tensile strength. Now the importance of load, mechanical load on injury repair, can't be stated you know, highly enough. So from an injury perspective, if you've had a previous hamstring strain or a previous bicep strain or a previous pec tear, and you haven't done your rehabilitation, you have a long-standing injury risk. So this is one of the reasons why when you're working with clients, you need to make sure that you're on it and they're on it as far as the rehabilitation is concerned. Now, how do muscle injuries heal? So there's three phases of repair, and I'm telling you this because this becomes really important when it comes to your rehabilitation. So understanding the phases of, in, of healing 
allows you to start to intervene with your rehabilitation at the appropriate point. So the first thing that happens is obviously we've got some destruction. So you've lifted something that's too heavy, you've stopped suddenly, and you've torn the muscle. So you're in the destruction phase. Now this is characterized by inflammation. So we tend to find that the body's processes at this point are creating an inflammatory response. Along with that inflammatory response, you're getting platelets um, that aggregate in the area, and that stops the bleeding. So platelets are your clotting factors. They're the things that stop bleeding. They cause hemostasis. Now that's the early stage of injury repair. Muscle bleeds, we need to stop the bleeding. Platelets aggregate, and that basically forms a clot. That clot stops the bleeding. Now as you imagine, at this point, things are fairly fragile. That clot formation doesn't have any tensile strength. Put any load through it, and that might be from a static stretch, or it might be you lifting a, an empty bar or a bag. You'll find that that clot is easily dislodged, and that starts, to be, essentially then you re-injure the same injury. So in the early stages of, uh, of a muscle injury, this is one of the reasons why we advocate very little hands-on work. So if you're a massage therapist, sports therapist, physio, osteopath, first three to five days post-injury, we tend to do very little hands-on. And we also advocate very little in terms of mechanical load on the muscle because the tissues are fragile and you're going to find they're easily re-injured. Now, the repair stage, the body lays down scar tissue. And I think scar tissue has got a, it's got a bad rap. Scar tissue is repair tissue. And depending on what you do with that scar tissue determines how it behaves. So if it's muscle and you're, you, you want to make that scar tissue more extensible, more stretchy. If it's ligamentous, you want to make that scar tissue perform more of a stabilizing role. So essentially at this phase, the body is laying down weak collagen which starts the early process of repair. Now, the collagen at this point is weak. It hasn't got the same tensile strength as the muscle will have at some point in the future. So again, you have to be cautious about the type of activities that you're doing with these people. Because if you're too uh, aggressive with your rehabilitation, you tend to find that will start to re-injure the same weak repair tissue. So again, we'll talk about this on the next couple of slides. Now, once we're out of the repair stage, we get into the remodeling stage. And this is where the weak collagen matures into what they call type one collagen. There's 20 different types of collagen. Type three is what gets laid down in the repair phase. Type one is what it eventually matures into. And type one has a high tensile strength. So from a muscle perspective, it's able to withstand the loads of jumping, running, lifting, doing all the things that you'd expect your body to be able to do in a pain-free manner. So I tell you that really from a perspective that if you understand the phases of healing, you understand the interventions that we might apply as we go through those, those various stages. Now, again, this is important because it, again, gives you some idea. You know, a lot of the stuff that we do as therapists, it's, it's blind. We don't really know where in that continuum our patients are. So we have to rely on things like this, timelines that give us some, some idea of when to apply each intervention. Now, the zero, the zero to 48 hours, this is where we get that clot formation. So this is the point where the muscle is weak, it's easily re-injured because the clot doesn't have any tensile strength. So you stretch it, you're too aggressive with it, you dislodge the clot, muscle starts to bleed again, and you're back to square one. Day two to four, you've gone through the inflammation stage and the inflammation is now starting to reduce. Now again, at this stage, we haven't laid down repair tissue. We haven't laid down scar tissue. So essentially you're working on, there's a substance called fibrin, which is what the early repair tissue is formed of. And fibrin is like a spider's web. So you think about how fragile a spider's web is, the fibrin filaments that have filled the gap in the muscle they have the same tensile strength as that spider's web. So if you're pulling those apart, you're going to find they're going to tear really easily. Now, day four to 21 is when your body's laying down this scar tissue. And this, depending on what you do with that scar tissue, determines how well the muscle functions when they've returned back to full functional fitness. This is when we start to apply some of our 
exercise interventions. If you're a massage therapist, you might then start to do a little bit of hands-on, some deep tissue work. And the idea at this point is mechanical load, that's a really important concept, in basically increases the tensile strength of those muscle fibers, the repair tissue. So without mechanical load, if you rest these things, you'd have this weak um, lump of scar tissue that wouldn't behave like the rest of the muscle. So you then go back into your normal activities and that scar tissue tears and you have a, a reoccurrence of the same injury. So the process that we're going to go through is trying to now start to mechanically load from day four, day five, we're going to start to mechanically load that scar tissue so it starts to behave more like the parent tissue, more like the rest of the muscles that surround it. Now day 21 to day 60, this is the point where we can start to become a little bit more aggressive. So we can now start to introduce some strengthening work, some plyometric work, and actually start to make the muscle behave more like the parent muscle that surrounds it. So that timeline should give you some ideas as to when you're going to apply the interventions we're going to talk about on the next slide. So 0 to 48, it's weak, don't do too much. 2 to 4, it's still weak. You know, you might do some isometrics at this point. Day 4 to 21, you've still got the weak tissue. So again, we're careful in terms of what we're doing. Day 21 to day 60, then we can start to become a little bit more vigorous or aggressive with our interventions. Now, how do we rehabilitate muscle? So you'll see the acronym on the top there, police. Now you've probably all heard of RICE or PRICE or PRICED. Police is the more contemporary acronym. And it stands for protection, optimal loading, ice, compression, and elevation. So in the first five days post-injury, we're not gonna do any hands-on work with our clients. We're essentially gonna apply this police principle. Now the optimal loading, they found over the years, like back in the day, you know, I've been doing this 27 years now. So 27 years ago, the most up-to-date research suggested that rest was the best thing you could do for muscle injuries. In fact, for most injuries, you know, that was back in the day where we were advocating bed rest for back pain. Now, research has developed and our understanding of muscles has developed. And as a result, we now find that the faster you can start to optimally load the muscle, the faster the recovery is and the better the recovery is at the end of it. So I'm not suggesting that, you know, day three, day four, you're into plyometrics, but at this point, what we might be starting to do is just some gentle isometrics. So getting the muscle to contract with no movement in a mid-range position, so the muscle's at its optimum strength, and that will start to um, help to mature those collagen fibers. Ice, this is basically about controlling the, the um, inflammation. Compression is about increasing hydrostatic pressure and getting rid of the inflammation into the lymphatic system. And elevation, again, is about getting rid of the inflammation and dumping it back into the lymphatic system, which is the thing that collects all that extrastitial fluid. Probably zero to five days, you're going to apply your uh, police principles. Now, the next stage, we're moving into mobilization. Now, this is the early stage. So remember, at this point, the muscle tissue is still weak. It's not capable of withstanding the same force as it was prior to the injury. So this is where you're gonna to start to use your isometric contractions. So with isometrics, they are angle specific. So I'm gonna to talk to you, then forgive me if I'm telling you stuff to, to like teaching you to suck eggs, but isometrics are angle specific. So what you find is the, the angle, but the, the range that you train in, you get strength around 15 degrees either side of that range. So we tend to start in the mid-range position because due to the length tension relationship of the muscle, we've got maximal overlap and you're gonna find there's minimal load onto the muscle itself. We do a few, maybe a week of isometrics in the mid-range. We then move to inner range and we do a, few, a week there. We move to outer range, and we might do a week there. So over the course of that, period we're working from the middle position towards the inner and then towards the outer now some people this is where the individual um, and you know things like gender age all those things factor in some people respond much quicker than the time frame that i've just talked about and this is where your sort of clinical decision making and your rationale 
that's where that starts to play dividends. But mobilization, early stage, it's isometric contractions. You might start to introduce some hands-on work here, some sort of soft tissue work to increase uh, lymphatic drainage, start to load those fibers mechanically. But fundamentally, that's the point that you'd stop. You wouldn't want to start to any strengthen at this point. Now, moving on, strengthening work. So this is the point where we're now starting to try and turn that type three collagen into type one collagen. And that needs mechanical load to do that. So from a strengthening perspective, we'd start with you know, isotonic movement, so concentric and eccentric. We then move into more of an eccentric focus. So remember that the most likely movement that's gonna cause muscle injuries is an eccentric load. So eventually we're gonna to start to get back to the point where our muscle is able to withstand eccentric movements. And then once we're at that point, we can then start to introduce things like plyometrics, which is our power training. So plyometrics, you know, this is your box jumps, your depth jumps. These are the things that you're gonna to start to use to recruit your stretch shortening cycle. So inducing large amounts of force, which is gonna help that maturation process. And once you've gone through that stage, and this might take a few weeks, you then return them back into the sport. And this will depend on obviously the sport that you're working with. So in my situation, you know, I'm working with a lot of bodybuilders, powerlifters, strong men. In terms of the bodybuilders, they just need to be able to train because it's an aesthetic sport. Uh, there isn't any performance requirements. They're literally just able to, once they can start to load the muscle and start to train, they, they, that would be classed as returning back to sport. With the powerlifters, when you're talking about people who are lifting, you know, super physiological loads, this might, this period of time might take slightly longer. You know, I'll be looking at three weeks, four weeks before at that point. So this is all very much dependent upon the individual sport, the modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors that we talked about before, how long this process takes. But that process, that step-by-step -step process, is what we're going to try and use to rehabilitate our, our, our clients. So mobilization, place in the early stages, that's the first zero to five days. Mobilization, so isometric contractions. Strengthening, which is concentric and eccentric, and then start to move more towards an eccentric bias. Into power, which is your plyometrics, your box jumps, depth jumps, single leg hops, if we're doing lower limb rehabilitation, and then back into the sport. And once they are, you know, once they're at point, the point where they're pain free, they're able to produce the same amount of force on the left leg as the right leg or the right arm and the left arm. That's the point where you can start to push them back into, into their normal uh, everyday activities, their sports and activities. Right, so I'm going to stop share there. I'm going to answer some questions. So John w Willis, John Wills has asked, is there any benefit from collagen supplementation or soft tissue injury prevention? Um, my wife's just handed me a, um, a sheet of paper there. She's a dietitian. So she says, yes, indirectly via the gut, most athletes and normals have issues with gut integrity. Healing the gut via the use of collagen supplementation um, and reducing systemic inflammation optimizes the healing process. So I think in short, John, yes, there is some usefulness um, at increasing um, collagen supplementation. Collagen is the building blocks you know, of, of muscle tissue, ligament tissue, um, yeah, most of your musculoskeletal tissues. So making sure that your collagen uptake and supplementation is optimum certainly wouldn't help in terms, certainly wouldn't hurt in terms of uh, soft tissue injury and also prevention. What was the first three parts of police? So P was uh, protection. So that might be a short period of immobilization. It might be the use of crutches. It might be the use of a splint in the very, very early stages of injury, depending on the, on the severity of the injury itself. Um, optimal loading. So OL is optimal loading. And this has changed, uh, this more contemporary acronym has changed because what we found that years and years ago, rest was advocated. And we found that rest actually prolongs the period of recovery. Whereas if we can start the individual moving again, start to load the tissues appropriately for that particular point of the healing phase, 
we tend to find that ensures better recovery at the end, um, the end stage. Eyes, ice, so we all know about the, uh, the use of ice, and there is some debate about ice. So you'll find, if you look into the research from a, uh, a clinical perspective, so, you know, should you ice, should you heat? Well, at this point, in the early stage of an injury, when you're going through the inflammatory process, your body is basically producing various chemicals that cause vasodilation, widening of the arteries and the blood supplies, and increases the ability of those blood vessels. So it allows things to go in and out more easily. Now, when you apply ice, which I would do in the first 48 hours and probably not after that, you tend to find that you're actually causing vasoconstriction. So you're reducing the diameter of the arteries and you're reducing the permeability of those arteries. So personally, and this is supported by the evidence, I think after the first 48 hours of a muscle injury, physiologically, the use of ice probably is counterproductive to the healing process. In preference, because essentially muscles heal, because the muscles heal quickly because they've got a good blood supply, I would say from 48 hours onwards, the use of heat would be more appropriate because that encourages vasodilatation, the widening the arteries, and it also encourages more permeability of the arteries themselves, so it can allow things, you know, groceries in and waste products out. Now, that said, I don't just leave the swelling unattended to. What I tend to advocate in the early stages of an injury before we can start to mechanically load it is just some gentle range of movement exercise. So if we're talking about a calf strain, for example, I would be advocating dorsiflexion and plantar flexion of the ankle in a pain-free range because your muscles act like a pump. So essentially when you contract and relax your muscle, it squeezes the blood vessels and that pumps forwards and backwards. So rather than using ice to control the swelling, I tend to use gentle range of movement to control the swelling because I think ice is counterproductive to what your body's trying to do. Heat after 48 hours. So if that answers your question, Rebecca. Um, so the next question, what kind of eccentric tempo and rep range would you use when we have a muscle post police and would you change depending on the muscle injured? Yes, so I tend to find um, that the, it, it will yes, it depends on the muscle and rep range wise, I would say in the eccentrics, because you've gone through your concentric and eccentric phase, you've gone through your isotonic, I'd be working down into the sort of three to six rep range. So it's low reps because the, the degree of muscle damage from the eccentric exercise uh, needs to be ameliorated, needs to be moderated. So I'd be working in the kind of three to six rep range and it would depend on the muscle injured. Um, you know, you tend to find from a lower limb perspective, you can probably tolerate a slightly higher rep range in the, in the lower limb. Upper limb wise, you can tolerate a slightly less, slightly lower uh, rep range, you know, I think due to the size of the muscle. So if this is a completely different topic, feel free to brush it aside. If someone has reconstructed ligament, if they utilize surrounding muscle tendons, such as semitendinosus or gracilis for ACL, does this lead to greater risk of injury to these muscle tissues? So what they're asking is do, so with ligament injuries, and it's like, it is slightly off topic, um, but pertinent nevertheless, we tend to find whilst the ligament's in healing, which can take up to 18 months, uh, unless there's been a complete rupture when it, it doesn't heal, um, you tend to find that we use the muscles almost to act like a splint. So if we're talking about the ACL, we'd be looking at the quadriceps, hamstrings, possibly gastrox, because that crosses the knee joint posteriorly. So we would be using those to essentially splint the knee joint. Um, does it lead to greater risk of injury? I don't think so. And personally, in my experience, I haven't encountered anybody that's come across that we've been doing that protocol for and they've become uh, injured. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, the honest answer is I'm not sure. But in my experience, I don't think that's the case. I don't think you're increasing the risk of injury by utilizing those muscles to splint the, the injured ligaments. Any thoughts on reoccurring shin splints? 
I will be looking at gate mechanics. So you tend to find people with shin splints tend to, shin splints is, is inflammation of the periosteum. There's a membrane that surrounds your bone called the periosteum. It's innovated, so has a nerve supply, therefore is capable of producing pain. And due to the attachments of the muscles into that periosteum, if the muscle gets overworked, it pulls on the periosteum and that causes inflammation and that inflammation causes pain. So with shin splints, I usually look at gait mechanics. So are you a heavy heel striker? If you are, that dorsiflexion overuses your anterior tibialis muscle. And you'll find that's one of the contributing factors to shin splints, which tend to be more on the inside of your shin than the outside. Um, so keeping the anterior tibialis muscle nice and uh, pliable, you know, foam roll in it, trigger points in it, making sure that they stay uh, supple and able to withstand force. And then at the back, making sure your gastroc and soleus aren't tight, which is meaning that the muscles at the front are having to exert more force to get your foot into dorsiflexion. So reducing heel strike, and making sure the muscles at the front and the back are optimally lengthened, will make sure that you're, uh, will reduce your likelihood of shin splints. Heavy metal strength pros. Hi, Chris. Would you agree it's Jim McGill's idea that most powerlifters are overtraining the big three, both in volume and frequency, and needlessly increasing injury risk? Um, I don't, to be honest with you, I think the big three, for those that don't know these, Stuart McGill's a, a physiotherapist that's um, spent a lot of his career working on back pain. And about 10, 15 years ago, um, there was the, this big core stability movement. So some authors, some physios, Richardson, Hodges and Joel, came up with this concept that if we increase the strength of a muscle called transverse abdominus, we would support our back better and that would reduce back pain. Now, unfortunately, as has played out over the last 10, 15 years, that hasn't changed the back pain sort of epidemic. You know, back pain continues to rise exponentially. So McGill and those guys have had to rethink their original theories to come up with some different sort of approaches to the management of back pain. Now, the big three is a, a weird press up there's a side plank and there's a bird dog. Those are the big three. Do I think they're used excessively and do they increase the risk of injury? I think the only thing I'd say from that perspective is it's from a bracing perspective, I don't think they're an optimal way of teaching your athletes to brace. Now, I think there's better positions to, to adopt to encourage your powerlifters to brace the spine. And I think that from that perspective, it maybe increases the risk of injury because you're reliant upon you know, the, the, the activation of different muscles to brace as opposed to the ones that we should be using. So I don't think they're overtraining the big three. I don't think you can necessarily overtrain those things, but perhaps they're using those instead of adopting some different bracing strategies, some things that will activate the right muscles in a position that they're going to be lifting in. Any other questions? Um, I agree, I need to show you the reverse deadlift I use. Yeah, it's the same, that's from Chris. There's another question. How would you best train the bracing muscles? So we're talking, so from a, you know, a lower back perspective, um, bracing is something that you tend to find is probably best taught in a supine position. So lying on your back with your legs bent. So adopting something which would look like a squat position. So you'd have your feet resting on, your legs resting onto a bench, like 90-90, and you'd start your bracing in that position. So rib cage down, contracting the abdominal region, creating some intra-abdominal pressure. Once you've developed some ability to be able to brace in that position, which with, with the floor keeping your back in a neutral position, you then transition into standing and into something that replicated you know, the movement that you were going to perform more, more likely. So I'd probably move from the floor in a supine position into something like a goblet squat. And then I'd move from a goblet squat into a back squat. And then theoretically, once they've learned that initial bracing position unloaded, 
they should find it easier to get themselves into a, uh, a loaded race position. But typically, I think, I'm not sure, going back to Chris's point about overusing the big three, I'm not sure it's an overuse of that that causes the injury risk in, in powerlifting. I think it's ineffective bracing strategies. Um, Chris Duffin, you know, follow the Kabuki strength warrior. So Chris Duffin is, you know, a powerlifter. He's done some really nice stuff on his YouTube channel about um, bracing strategies, the use of a belt. That's another sort of common misconception. I think people seem to think that a belt, using a weightlifting belt, reduces the activation of your muscles and makes you back and your, your core weak, which is a, which is a misconception. The, the belt allows you to brace, to push into the belt, to effectively brace your spine. So that's a, it's a way of, it's almost like biofeedback. You push into your belt, that creates the activation, creates the intra-abdominal pressure, and that's what supports your back. Uh, yes, and I would train those isometrically. So absolutely. So I think if you're training the bracing muscles in those positions, you want to be doing stuff isometrically where there's no movement taking place, you're holding that brace position for periods of time to develop the, the, the correct activation patterns. Um, what could be the possible cut? Oh, I don't know, I missed one. So another one from Chris. I've seen lots of straight anterior stuff recently for shoulder health. Any thoughts on this? So serratus anterior is a muscle that sits underneath your scapula and you tend to find with a lot of shoulder problems, they start to develop alterations in the scapula movements. So you get an impingement of your supraspinatus tendon, um, you know, you get some kind of injury to the shoulder. And what you tend to find happens is the shoulder starts to elevate and protract because this is the capsular pattern of the shoulder. So your brain's basically trying to create a muscular splint around the shoulder itself. Now, because we're all, you know, we're all fit and active people, we carry on training because we think it's just a minor little niggle that will go. And actually what you're doing is you're reinforcing those pain pathways and reinforcing those movement patterns until eventually you start to change the movement of your scapula. So you start to get what's called scapular dyskinesis. Now, when you change the movement pattern of your scapula, you change the activation of the muscles around it. And one of the muscles that then becomes problematic is this serratus anterior muscle. So I think serratus anterior is an important muscle if you have scapular dyskinesis, so you have alteration in the scapular movements, but I don't think it's the be all and end all in terms of shoulder rehab. Because if your scapula is moving normally, you know, I think approaching it from a rotator cuff perspective, and then reloading it back up, that would be just as effective. What could be the possible cause of what feels like muscle sprain at the back of the knee? Uh, comes on particularly walking, running, I do a little hypermobility in the knee, could this contribute? Yeah, so hypermobility um, essentially means that you've got your joints move excessively. So you've got additional range of movement in your joints. Now, hypermobility, one of the things that I should have mentioned in the non-modifiable risk factors is hypermobility syndrome. Now there's varying degrees of this. I think we've talked about this on other, other webinars that we've done. You know, you've got hypermobility syndrome, which is what a lot of female athletes suffer from. This is where your joints are a little bit bendy, they bend back on themselves, the knees hyperextend. You then progress into connective tissue disorders like Ehlers-Danlos and Marfan syndrome, which are a little bit more serious. But hypermobility syndrome, is definitely an injury risk because your joint has got additional range of movements. Um, so yes, I would say hypermobility is definitely an issue in terms of um, overusing muscles. What could be the possible cause? What feels like a muscle sprain at the back of the knee, top of the calf, bottom of the hamstring? It's either going to be a gastroc muscle which crosses the knee and helps with knee flexion or it's going to be one of the hamstring muscles. We'd have to, we'd have to do some tests to work out which one, that would, which one that was. Is there validity in Greece in strength and then to reduce risk of injury? Tightness for general rank, gen pop. Um, I think strength through range is absolutely essential at reducing injury risk. Um, and I think making sure that your athletes have optimal range of movements and strength through that range of movements is one of the best ways to reduce your injury risk. Um, like we said before, tight muscles, 
you reach the plastic zone much quicker because you've lost that initial uncrimping of the muscle fibers because the muscle's tight. Next question. I don't have many questions. It must be the caffeine. <laughs> Chris is saying he's, he's taken too much caffeine. Um, Rebecca, with rotation through the rib cage causing right shoulder and right hip, would you stop bilateral movements? So this is an interesting question. So if you train bilaterally predominantly, so you train you know, double arm, double leg all the time, you tend to find you start to develop bilateral dominance. Now, as a compensation strategy for that, you start to develop rotation patterns. So for example, I worked with a powerlifter recently who had a recurrent hamstring strain on his right leg. And initially, I was thinking it was due to the mixed grip he was using on his deadlift. When we unloaded him, and we got him doing things like single heel touches, single arm farmer's walks, on his um, left side, he was able to brace and control movements really easily. On his right side, the minute we started to load that, he developed this rotation compensation strategy. Now, if you think about it from a deadlift perspective, he's rotating to the right. As he starts that first pull, he's loading his hamstring quicker on the right side than he's on the left side. And I think that was the thing that contributed to this recurrent hamstring problem. So I think bilateral movements need to be um, appropriately used alongside unilateral movements because otherwise you're at risk of this bilateral dominance, this rotation compensation strategy. Chris, any beard grown tips? No, I mean, I shaved this off at the start of lockdown and uh, as you can see, it's, it's grown quite quickly. No, just a healthy lifestyle. What do you think of resistant training for muscle growth? Yeah, I think, I think that's pretty much um, the evidence supports the fact that resistance training does produce muscle growth. I think there's enough evidence out there that suggests that's what you need to be doing. How would you train hypermobility if we to other clients? So from a hypermobility perspective, what happens in hypermobility syndrome is your ligaments are a little bit uh, lax. So ligaments are, they not just connect bone to bone and create joint stability. They're a big source of proprioception. Now, for those of you who don't know, proprioception is basically your body awareness. It basically tells your brain where that joint is in space. This is the reason why you can close your eyes and find your, your nose with your finger. Now, one of the things I would do with my clients with hypermobility is lots of balance and proprioception type exercise because it's not so much that they have um, laxity through weakness, they have an injury risk because of this reduction in proprioception. So I think the only way I'd train my, I'd get them as strong as I could, build up the strength in the muscles around it, very much like we talked about before, brace the joints and support the joints. But I'd also be doing a lot of proprioceptive type movements um, to make sure that the, the ligaments were firing and sending information back to the brain sufficiently well. And it's the same when you're dealing with ligament injuries generally. So Sean, thoughts on the trigger ball for overactive muscles? Is it actually useful to use for helping reduce muscle tightness? Uh, or is it a waste of time for the supposed short lasting effectiveness? I think that Foam rolling and trigger balls, really useful in conjunction with some long sustained stretches. Now, I think if you've got a little bit of tightness, you know, you've trained and you've got a little bit of tightness in a certain muscle group that you've trained, I think getting onto a foam roller and loosening that off is absolutely adequate in terms of reducing the soreness and the tightness post-training. I think if that tightness is starting to cause issues with movements, so you're not able to hit some of your archetypes, you know, you're not able to hit this full depth in your squat, you're not able to hip hinge effectively because your hamstrings are so tight, then I think you need to be spending more time on long sustained stretches. I don't think the foam rollers and the trigger pointing will cut it. And I think the other thing to say on that is it needs to be done kind of every day religiously. It's one of those things, it's very much like training. You know, the reversibility of mobility happens very quickly. So you gain mobility quickly, but you also lose it if you stop doing it. So foam rolling, trigger pointing, you know, acute post-exercise, just to take away the tightness and the, and the soreness post-exercise. If you've got limitations in movements, 
then I think you need to spend some time identifying where you've got the restrictions and then spending some time on some long sustained stretches. And they'll, they'll prove more bang for your buck. Uh, next question from another one from Chris. Do you recommend structured deloads? Yes, I think the, I mean, certainly from an injury perspective, you know, the point where most people get injured, coming back to that point we made about fatigue, is when they've had a long sustained block of training. And I think the, if we hit them with a deload before they get to the point where they're starting to not want to train, their joints are aching, I think you've got a better chance then of reducing the risk of injury. Um, so yes, I think deloads are a really important part of both your bodybuilders, your stre- you know, your powerlifters, strong men, strong women, and most other athletes. Um, I think the problem is with a lot of the strength sports, we've developed this focus on progressive overload. So literally going into the gym and we're chasing numbers or we're chasing, you know, reps. And I think physiologically, your body doesn't work like that. And certainly your tendons don't work like that. And I think this is why tendon injuries in strength athletes are so problematic because tendons like a bit of load and then like a bit of time to recover. What doesn't happen in, you know, in strength sports is typically that. So essentially you're loading, you're loading, you're loading, you're loading. And there's no time for those tendons to recover. And that's why you then start to find you, you know, your tendons get hot and squealy. So yes, I think deloads are a really important part for every athlete. What do you think about the snap? I don't know about the snapback theory of stretching. Elaborate for me, Rebecca. Send me a message. Send us another message through. Um, snapback theory of stretching. I would imagine what you're talking about with the snapback theory of stretching is once you've elongated a muscle, it stretch it returns back to its previous length. Now, stretching contrary to popular belief, doesn't necessarily, acute stretching doesn't necessarily change muscle length. What it's doing is it's actually reducing uh, the nervous system activity. So when you acutely stretch, you know, you stretch for a short period of time, the changes in muscle length aren't because the muscle's elongated, the changes in muscle length because your muscle spindles, the intrafusal muscle fibers have relaxed. So your nervous system is relaxed and giving you more length. Long sustained stretching, you know, and this is when we're talking about holding stretches for two minutes, not words, on a daily basis. Over a period of about four to six weeks, that actually changes muscle length. So you are changing muscle length. Yeah, I would imagine that's what you mean by the snapback theory. So DC training, weighted stretches. Yeah, I think the, I like the DC training idea. So DC is Dante Trudel or dog crap training. Um, and he advocates that we should be doing intraset stretching. So you finish your chest and then you'll do a long sustained stretch, hold it for 60 to 90 seconds on that chest muscle. Um, are we increasing injury risk? No, because I think the muscle's warm at that point um, and you finish training that muscle. So it's, the la- it's after you do your intraset stretch and after you finish your last set of chest based exercises. So I think you're unlikely to be increasing your risk of injury. However, that said, you know, static stretching, intraset stretching in between each set, I think potentially does. And it also reduces your power output. So there's lots and lots of evidence that static stretching reduces power output. So in strength sports, this is why we tend not to advocate pre-event stretching or pre-lift stretching. It's all done. Those long sustained stretches are done at the end. That's where you use your foam roll, you know, early stage stuff, pre-event stuff, that's your foam rolling, that's your mobility stuff, you know, the bands, the trigger point balls, because all we're trying to do there is actually get the joints in a position where we can hit depth. It's not about actually elongating the muscles. So I like DC training, I like the DC weighted stretches, um, and I don't think they increase the risk of injury because they're done at the end of that training session when the muscle's warm and you're not going into another lift on that particular muscle group. Is long duration stretching actually effective? I've seen stuff talking about how it doesn't impact nervous system enough and the stretch and improve feeling the muscle is short lived. Um, is weighted stretching a better option? Yeah, so I think the, the, the research in terms of long sustained stretching, just like any research, is mixed. Um, you know, you look at the evidence for ice, 
There's a handful of papers that say ice is really useful. There's a handful of papers that says ice is less useful. I think what you have to do when you're looking at the research is apply some experience and some anecdotal evidence. So in my experience, the long sustained stretching seems to be effective at increasing muscle length and range of movement as long as you are keeping up to that daily mobility practice. So just like anything, you know, everything reverses, muscle strength reverses, giving enough time away from lifting weights. So I'm not sure if it's that that's not effective enough or it's just the fact that when you cease doing it, those gains that you've made reverse. Um, weighted stretching, yeah, I think that comes back to the DC kind of idea. So at the end of a session, applying some external load to push your muscles into a slightly um, bigger range of movements. I think within I think that's a useful adjunct because I think a lot of times, you know, certainly if you look at some of the stuff that we post on Instagram, you'll find I'm using body weight a lot of the time when I'm trying to increase length of a muscle. So I think weighted stretching um, isn't necessarily a better option, it's another option. And I think you'd have to play caution where you applied those weighted stretches to. Because I think there's, there comes a point with the weighted stretches where you're going to get back into think of your stress strain curve again i think with the weighted stretches you're in danger of reaching the plastic zone rather than the elastic zone much quicker than you would do if you were doing this unweighted so i think i would argue that weighted stretches potentially increase injury risk more sure in terms of as soon as you've stopped stretching it goes back to its previous length yes um, it does acutely, so this goes back to our snapback theory. So Rebecca said, in terms of as soon as you've stopped stretching, it goes back to its previous length. Yes, acutely it does. This is why your mobility stuff needs to be done on a, a daily and long-term perspective, because that's what tends to change the, the fascicle length. Um, next question, what are your thoughts on periodized program for females to support hormonal changes, which can affect the likelihood of tendon or ligament injury? Yeah, certainly with the, the female athletes that we work with, Rach, we almost work on a, a two-week cycle. So they'll have two weeks where they're trying to build strength and build load. And then there's two weeks where we might reduce the load by around about 30% to take into consideration those hormonal changes. Now, certainly from a tendon and ligament perspective, there's lots and lots of evidence when we look at ACL injuries that around about day 21, when you've got this big spike of hormonal changes, the increase, the likelihood of damaging ligaments is much greater. So I think, yes, we factor that into our training programs and periodize our programs based on those hormonal fluctuations. I think the... Depending on the level of female athlete you're working with, you know, the, the higher level female athletes, a lot of those become amenorrheic, and so the periods stop. So they haven't got those large fluctuations in hormones. So that changes the periodization protocol slightly. So I think it depends whether, you st whether you're having a period. Yes, I would definitely program based on that. If you're amenorrheic, I would be less worried about those massive fluctuations in hormones and then the risk on tendon and ligament injury. Right, that's the last question, guys. So we just come up to five past the hour of three. Thank you very much indeed for your uh, attendance and for your questions. I hope that was useful. We are recording this. So um, this will be on YouTube probably in the next week or so. So for those of you who don't want to go back over anything, cover anything again, um, check that out on YouTube. The tendinopathy webinar is on there as well. So if you missed that the first time around, you can go back and revisit that. Uh, I wish you all a happy Wednesday. I think it's Wednesday, isn't it? Day blows into one on lockdown. And um, look out for the next one. Thanks, guys.